USS Michigan, or BB-27, was America's first dreadnought. And you're probably saying, no. History in the dark. Darkness the curse. You're wrong. And I'm gonna type a mean comment to you about this. Because this is a South Carolina class. And therefore her sister, South Carolina, was the first dreadnought battleship for the United States. And if we go by numbers, BB-26 South Carolina would indeed be considered the first. But there's a problem here. See, Michigan was laid down one day before South Carolina. She was launched a month and a half before South Carolina, and she was commissioned almost two months before South Carolina. So while she has a later number, and the class is named for her sister, Michigan's the older one. So technically speaking, USS Michigan was the first dreadnought of the United States. She was 452 feet 9 inches long overall. She had a beam of 80 feet 3 inches and a draft of 24 feet 6 inches. She would displace 16,257 tons as designed and up to 17,900 tons at full load. She'd be powered by two shaft vertical triple expansion engines that were rated for 16,500 horsepower and fueled by 12 coal-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers, pushing her to a top speed of 21 miles per hour, 18 and a half knots. She had a cruising range of 5,000 nautical miles at a speed of 10 knots, and she had a crew of 869 officers and enlisted men. Her armament consisted of a main battery of eight 12-inch Mark V guns in four twin gun turrets on her center line, which were each placed in two super-firing pairs, both forward and aft. Her secondary battery consisted of 22 3-inch guns mounted in casemates along the side of her hull, and she had a pair of 21-inch torpedo tubes submerged in her hull on each broadside. Her main armor belt was 12 inches thick, over her magazines, 10 inches thick over the machinery spaces, and 8 inches thick everywhere else. Her armored deck was between 1.5 to 2.5 inches thick, the gun turrets had 12 inch thick faces, and their supporting barbettes had 10 inch thick armor plating. 10 inch thick armor also protected the casemate guns, and her conning tower had 12 inch thick sides. Michigan would be laid down on December 17, 1906, at the New York Shipbuilding Corporation. She was launched May 26, 1908, and fitting out was completed by January 4, 1910, and she was commissioned into the United States Navy. She was assigned to the Atlantic Fleet and began a shakedown cruise to the Caribbean, which lasted until June 7. She joined training maneuvers off of New England beginning on January 29th, and a training cruise over to Europe soon followed. She left Boston, Massachusetts on November 2nd, stopping over in Portland in the United Kingdom, as well as Cherbourg, France, arriving there December 8th, and actually remained there until the 30th, when she left for the Caribbean again. She reached Guantanamo Bay in Cuba on January 10th, 1911, and continued on to Norfolk, Virginia. And an interesting fact should be made about Michigan. One of the members of her crew was a man named John Henry Towers, who was notable as a naval aviation pioneer. He served on Michigan as a spotter for the main guns, and the long range of those guns, which had enough power to shoot farther than the actual horizon, convinced him that spotter aircraft should start being used. She then cruised the East Coast for most of the following two years, on November 15th, 1912, she would head off for a much longer cruise into the Gulf of Mexico. She then headed south to Veracruz, where she arrived on December 12th, and remained there for two days before beginning her voyage home, reaching Hampton Roads on December 20th. She patrolled the East Coast again for the first half of 1913. On July 6th, she would steam out of Quincy, Massachusetts, for yet another voyage down to Mexican waters. And this particular voyage had been the results of the Mexican Civil War, which threatened American interests in the country. She arrived off of Tampico on July 15th, and thereafter cruised off the Mexican coast until the 13th of January 1914, where she headed back to New York City. 
Then she transferred to Norfolk. On February 14th, she would leave port for a short voyage back to Guacanayabo Bay in Cuba, though was back in Hampton Roads by March 19th. She had a third cruise to Mexico on April 16th to help support the United States occupation of Veracruz. She reached there on April 22nd and landed a battalion of Marines as part of the occupation force. She then patrolled the coast before heading back to the U.S. on June 20th. She would reach the Delaware Cape six days after that. For the next three years, she settled into more peacetime cruises, just kind of floating about, vibing, hanging. Not really doing a whole heck of a lot, though in December of 1914, her crew would start experimenting with newer fire control directors to aid in gun laying. Those directors produced really good results in gunnery tests conducted in early 1915. In September of 1916, she conducted gunnery practice with the old monitor, Miantanamo, serving as a target. On September 21st, during another round of this, the shell in Michigan's left gun on the forward super-firing turret decided to explode. And I mean explode before actually leaving the gun. The gun would be severed, and fragments from the shell would damage the forecastle deck and the superstructure. One man was injured by a piece of debris, but fortunately this didn't result in any deaths, and she would have to return to the Philadelphia Navy Yard for repairs. On April 6, 1917, the United States would finally declare war on Germany and enter World War I. But, due to her slower speed than newer dreadnoughts, Michigan would be assigned to Battleship Force 2, and was tasked with training naval recruits, as well as escorting convoys. As part of the training missions, she would participate in fleet maneuvers and gunnery exercises. On January 15, 1918, she was cruising off of Cape Hatteras on a training exercise when a heavy gate and rough seas managed to knock over her forward cage mast. She'd rolled really badly to port before rolling sharply back to starboard, causing the cage mast to give way, snapping at its narrowest point, which interestingly had been damaged in the explosion I mentioned earlier. It was repaired, but only barely. It was just patched over, so it was a weak spot. This accident managed to kill six men and injured another 13. She was forced to steam back to Norfolk transferring the injured to the hospital ship Solace, and then went to the Philadelphia Navy Yard for further repairs, arriving there on January 22nd. By early April, she was fixed, though, back in service, and for the next several months, she trained gunners in the Chesapeake Bay, while on another escort that had left the United States on September 30th, her port screw fell off. Just, just fell off. It, what? It happens. As a result of this, she was forced to leave the convoy on October 8th and returned to port for repairs again. She remained out of service for the rest of the war. In November of 1918, Germany would sign the armistice and end World War I. Michigan was then assigned to the cruiser and transport force in late December of 1918 to ferry American soldiers back from Europe. She made two round trips in 1919 for this, and between them, she would personally ferry back 1,062 men home to America. In May, Michigan would be sent to Philadelphia for an overhaul that lasted through June, and then returned to her peacetime training routine. On August 6, she would be reduced, though, to limited commission, and stationed at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Dreadnought technology had advanced quite a bit over the last decade and throughout World War I. The first Dreadnoughts of America, the South Carolinas, were starting to be seen as very outdated compared to many of their more modern cousins, so Michigan and her sister did not have much time left. But they still kept them around for at least a little bit longer. On May 19th, 1920, she seemed to Annapolis to pick up a contingent of midshipmen for a major training cruise. After departing Annapolis, she headed south and transited the Panama Canal before heading to Honolulu, Hawaii, arriving there on July 3rd. She visited several naval bases on the west coast of the United States throughout the summer, before she returned to Annapolis on September 2nd. Three days later, she'd be back in Philadelphia, where she was decommissioned. 
But interestingly, she didn't stay that way. In 1921, she was actually reactivated for another cruise down to the Caribbean, departing on April 4th. She would return to Philadelphia on April 23rd, but then, interestingly, she would wind up embroiled in a scandal? What? Her commanding officer at the time, Clark Daniel Stearns, instituted a series of sailors' committees on May 3rd to ease tensions between officers and the crew. The commanders of the Atlantic Fleet and Michigan Squadron decided that these committees were actually a threat to discipline and evidence of Marxist influences. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, this... <laughs> Basically, what was happening is that Stearns was having his men form unions to try to make things work better, but the Navy did not like that at all. Edwin Denby, who was then the Secretary of the Navy, was contacted, and Stearns was relieved of command after her commanding officer was removed for being a filthy communist. On May 28th, Michigan would pick up another group of midshipmen for yet another training cruise. This voyage took her back to Europe, with stops at multiple ports. She'd be back in Hampton Roads by August 22nd. By this point, discussions between Britain, America, and Japan in order to limit the amount of warships was being considered. The nations at the time didn't want to start a naval arms race, so wound up convening the Washington Naval Conference to discuss limitations, which would produce the Washington Naval Treaty, signed by each nation in February of 1922. Under the terms of Article 2 of the treaty, both Michigan and her sister South Carolina were to be scrapped. As the oldest dreadnoughts, they were considered obsolete anyway. Michigan, America's first dreadnought, would put to sea for the last time on August 31st. She was bound for the Breakers Yard in Philadelphia. She went there under her own power. She arrived there on September 1st. She'd be stricken from the Naval Vessel Register on November 10th, 1923, and broken up for scrap just the next year. It's a sad end for America's first dreadnought, and though her career was relatively short, it was actually a lot more interesting than one would think. She served faithfully, and should never be forgotten. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Road Videos, Lord Off 444, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, Royal Hudson 2060, I Surfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGrow, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Jenton, Master of None, The Oklahoma Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, Amtrak 2024 Productions, Tommy Rossini, That Guy with a Beard, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mark Holding, Dr. Racer 78, G. Wiz, and Mr. Terevel. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.